Hello and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. Today we have Netflix 142nd film. It's the 2019 action adventure Triple Frontier. It's directed by JC Shandor and it stars Ben Affleck, Oscar Isaac, Charlie Hunnam, Garrett Hedlund and Pedro Pascual. I am Jesse and I have my very good friend MJ back with me again. I'm so excited. How are you MJ? I, you're not as excited as I am. I've gone from uh, being obviously a co-host on the Flix Forum podcast to a fan of the Flix Forum podcast for the past couple of months, uh, listening to you do an incredible job on a lot of movies that I would have liked to have seen and I will try and catch up on. But it's nice to be back and it's nice to be back with a film like this. It's, it's going to be very different. I might be a bit out of sync um, having to throw in between um, someone else <laughs> for a while. I don't know if you, there was a couple of episodes ago I had a, had a guest on and um, it was a bit out of whack because I wasn't used to it. So I'm uh, looking forward to actually hearing someone else's thoughts rather than me just uh, regurgitate rubbish onto the mic by myself. So uh, uh, it's very, not rubbish. Very, <laughs> very, very happy to have you here. And obviously we want to talk about this film Um as soon as possible. So let's start off with our fast flicks with our short little summary of uh, the film and hit us off, MJ. All right. So Triple Frontier is a group of mates who are highly skilled ex-soldiers go in for the whole one last job to set themselves up financially. And they find themselves having to call on every last piece of skill and experience to drag them through. Oh, lovely. I Similar thoughts. It's, you know, it's a chance to take out an important drug kingpin and there's a group of mercenaries that band together with more personal motives than simply keeping the streets clean. Well, you better believe their personal motives. Oh, I reckon. So uh, we, we do like to talk a little bit about how films are put together by Netflix or how they get the rights to certain films. So I think we have quite a bit to, to touch with this one. And MJ usually does an excellent job of doing this. So he's going to start us off. Go. Well, funnily enough, obviously I don't do any of this research till I've watched the film and we've done this, you know, plenty of times. And I get disappointed when there's not much information out there uh, because Netflix rolls out that many films that this is not that big a story, but this one was really exciting to figure out how the hell this film became a Netflix original film, because this, this screenplay, let's just call it for the start. It's, it's had a hell of a journey. Um, it appears there were several iterations of this movie that never quite made it to production. And it goes all the way back to, 2010 and this is when it had Catherine Bigelow directing which I noticed she was uh, listed as an executive producer so she obviously hung around a little bit um, yeah. but she was going to direct this back in 2010 and, and Tom Hanks had been cast in the role and Johnny Depp was also in talks and this is when Paramount Pictures uh, was on board to make it and then the production just kind of lagged and never really went anywhere and we jump all the way to 2015 so it's five years later Catherine Bigelow has gone because she's got a clash the film's titled Sleeping Dogs, being produced uh, through Atlas Entertainment. Tom Hanks is still kind of sniffing around, and, and Will Smith was also rumoured before then. He eventually had a clash with Collateral Beauty, so he was out. Then 2017, Tom Hanks is out. Johnny Depp, who was rumoured earlier, is also out. Channing Tatum and Tom Hardy sign on for, re for the lead roles. Mersha Ali also joins the cast. And then about a month before shooting was set to commence... Triple Frontier then gets dropped by Paramount. Uh, obviously, Channing Tatum and Tom Hardy are both out. Mahershala Ali stays on the project, uh, and so does Adri Arjona, um, who was attached at that point as well. Um, and then still in 2017, this is when Netflix does its thing, where it jumps on board to negotiate the rights to acquire the film. And then at this point, they've got Ben Affleck and Casey Affleck in talks to replace the lead roles. Ben Affleck's in, but then he's out again. So Mark Wahlberg gets into talks. <laughs> they then they then get Charlie Hunnam, Garrett Hedlund, and Pedro Pascal to jump on board with Adria Jonah. And as you know, all four of them do make the final film. <laughs> Mersha Ali at this stage is still attached to the project. And the plan was to shoot it in August 2017 in Hawaii and Colombia. That plan falls through because everything else has fallen through. <laughs> so we skip ahead to March 2018. And principal production finally commences in Oahu in Hawaii. Ben Affleck's back somehow. <laughs> but Mersha Ali is, is forced to drop out after obviously this delay. They filmed for about four months, wrapping in July of that same year. Uh, they had a world premiere uh, in New York City on the 3rd of March in 2019. Film was then released in theatres on the 6th of March before worldwide streaming on Netflix a week later. 
Uh, and then Netflix did announce that it was seen by over 52 million viewers on the service within its first month of release. We obviously always enjoy when Netflix gives us some stats and data because, well, they're telling us what, what they want to hear as opposed to us being able to get any independent source, but uh, we'll take it. Yeah, and I think uh, when they released that data, a lot of people were like, well, based on the budget for this, that's not that good. So then in July, they came out and said, <laughs> you know, 63 million people have now watched it. So uh, they were trying to pump their tires up on on how this one had gone. Uh, but uh, you've, you've done that so well. Like I've, I think I had like a whole page of all of everything that you've said that you've been able to summarize in such a nice little succinct way. So um, <laughs> uh, so good to have you back. So good to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> what a story though, man. Like this is... What- talking like 10 years basically from when this film was supposed to be made to when it actually got released uh and like in 2010 when this film was in the works netflix wasn't even doing this stuff like what it, it's just happened so quickly and changed so much yeah i think that um you know then i always try to find something about the, uh, how the director feels about working with netflix and i've got another little positive sort of spin i guess on, oh, yes. on um when, when the director Shandor, he was talking about when he first read the script and, um, and I should say now, spoiler alert, if, uh, if you do want to watch this oh, film and don't want to know anything about this film, yeah. uh, give us a pause now. Cause I'm going to jump into a bit of a spoiler, a little bit of one um, where when he first read the script, there was a, a secondary character that was sort of killed at the end as the conclusion. And, um, you know, he, the director, he couldn't even remember which one it was, but um, it was someone else. And then he met with Ben Affleck for the first time and, and Affleck's like, nah, how about, we, we changed that character to someone else without giving away spoilers. And um, <laughs> you've done a spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, true. And then, um, so yeah, so um, Ben Affleck actually came up with this change and, um, and Affleck said, look, I've, I've tried to do this with films before with big studios where I want to change things up and they haven't let me, but with Netflix on board, they were able to do this and, and switch it up. So another bit of a positive um, story with how the narrative actually plays out that, you know, Netflix, like here's the cash, do what you want. Uh, which is good. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know that part of the story. And I think that was, we'll talk about that scene later on, but that's, that's fascinating because as much as this was a project that was being, you know, thrown around by Paramount and sometimes Netflix do pick up a film that's basically been completely made by another studio and they just st- grab the distribution rights at the end, but Netflix to the, like they were in this from the very start of principal production. So it truly is a Netflix original film. Uh, but, and we um, talked about the budget yeah. earlier because the budget was, $115 million, which at this point in time, and what is it, 2021, June 2021, this is currently the third most expensive Netflix original movie from a production perspective behind The Irishman and behind Six Underground. Uh, we know that Red Notice and The Grey Man are probably going to come out one day. I feel like we're t- talking about them forever, but uh, they'll probably surpass it when they release. But $115 million, huge budget. So this is a big, big get for Netflix and a big gamble. We're talking about $115 million is the same budget as uh, all the Star Wars episodes one, two, and three, which interesting. Obviously, Lucasfilms was really keen on sticking to that budget for all three films. <laughs> Didn't want to go over it. Uh, Monsters, Inc., Wolverine, The Huntsman, Winter's War were all $115 million, But some of the bigger budget recent movies that, um, that actually had a smaller budget than this was things like Deadpool 2, Gravity, San Andreas, The Martian. So that's, that's how big scale this budget actually was. Yeah, I was hoping I was going to be able to surprise you with some uh, similar budgets, but you've got all the ones I've got. The only other one I had was um, the 2018 Venom one as well. It was, it was 116, mm. so very, very close in the ballpark. Uh, but yeah, some some big, big name movies. And um, yeah, $115 million, it's so much money. Uh, it is so much money, but you, you can see that- you're not uh, making anything at the box office. Well, not much. Very, very true. Office. And I mean, it, I think I'll mention this now, like the locations for the filming in Hawaii, like I think uh, something such really, really beautiful scenes. And I know they did some in Colombia, but I guess uh, to be able to, to, to get the whole crew, keep it on us soil, uh, you know, you'd think that would sort of bring the budget down a little bit, but uh, obviously not. Mm. The cast, <laughs> the cast probably takes up a lot of it. Well, that's true as well. And I look, I think from what I can gather, the, the very opening scene, uh, where that siege takes place. I think that was in Colombia. I'm not sure whether anything else was actually filmed in Colombia. I think it was just that scene. Um, so. I've actually, I actually visited, I went to Hawaii before the world went into like complete and utter lockdown like a year and a half ago and, and actually visited um, a lot of the places where this film was, was shot. And I'll, I'll talk about it again later in one of the scenes, but um, you can absolutely see it when you're watching the film, the beautiful, beautiful mountain scenery. It's, it's stunning. Um, 
and I'm excited to say that I saw it at the flesh. As, as an Australian, <laughs> we don't get to see too many film sets in America, so it's cool. Very, very true. Um, I guess a couple of last little things. The, the, the title of the film, Triple Frontier, it refers to this area of South America, which is known for that high level of, um, I guess, drug trafficking and, and contraband. So the title fits in with what they're trying to say here. Um, the only I looked up to, um, I always like to check out if it's titled something different in other countries. And I was waiting know, for this. <laughs> in Vietnam, it, it's called The Unwilling Bandit, which I thought was a uh, an interesting, interesting. Not, not even bandits, but The Unwilling Bandit. Just one so, of them. Uh, yeah, only one unwilling. of them was unwilling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I get it. The other thing too is this was uh, nominated for a couple of awards. Uh, the location team of the year for a studio feature film at the Californian Location Awards. It was also nominated for the best action movie at the IGN Summer Movie Awards and favorite drama movie at the People's Choice Awards of 2019. So um, some popular sorts of awards there with the ING and the, the People Choice Awards. Uh, yeah, other than that, not much of a, a sniffle from anyone. That's good. No, we'll take that though. Definitely. Uh, this is not a real big awards movie. I, don't know, I wouldn't have thought. Oh, well, that lead us into a, the consensus time about what some critics and the audiences are actually saying. Yeah, so I'm looking at a 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb, uh, and that's 113,000 ratings. So it's funny, this, uh, and I'll get to that in a sec. So 113,000 ratings as opposed to Letterboxd, which gives us a 3 out of 5 with 57,000 ratings. You can see how many more people watched this on, uh, logged this on IMDb than they did Letterboxd, which to me, Ties into the fact that it is that real mainstream kind of popcorny sort of movie, which Netflix absolutely needs to get that audience as much as anybody else. So um, I think they'd be pretty happy with those numbers. They're not outstanding, but 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb, yeah, we'll take it. And yeah, I think the eyeballs is the big thing there. Uh, and the yeah. same with with Rotten Tomatoes, the the audience there's over a thousand people, which is pretty high for, for Rotten Tomatoes audiences to get on board. I only had it at 55% though, so a little bit lower than the others. The critics, sort of um, similar to the other ones, I guess, where they had it at 71% on 135 reviews. So that's a lot of critics that have seen this. So that, that's fresh on the, the critics' view for Rotten Tomatoes. That's really good for a Netflix original where they're not probably getting screens or anything for it. They're just going out of their way to watch the new Ben Affleck film kind of thing. Yeah. So I guess it's time for the early thoughts. What are your early thoughts on this film? Well, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the whole drug cartel you know, former soldiers, heist type scene. And then this movie kind of ticks so many boxes of, of those sort of movies. But it's not to say that I dislike them. It's just that for me, there's generally a real ceiling on, on how good these films can be. But I did like this one. I think um, I think the cast certainly helped. I'm, I'm a big fan of Oscar Isaac. And I think we all kind of have a soft spot for Ben Affleck somewhere deep inside. But the concept itself seemed fun and it seemed plausible enough and, the exploration of the male friendship and brotherhood always hits the right spot for me. So I, I generally enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm sort of sitting in the same boat as you. I think that if you're after an action film that sort of builds on characters and wants you to think about their morals, this probably isn't for you. I think that it, um, like while the film, it does give you a reason to, to see each of the, the men and why they need the money. Um, and, and then they sort of just let them go for it. So I think mm. it's more like this pure sort of action adventure survival story, but it is lots of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. good, good summary. All right. Characters hit us off with some characters. Yeah. I think um, one thing I like about these characters is that you, you do see a change in a lot of them when they're exposed to either opportunities of greed or, the possibility that they're genuinely fighting for their lives. So I'll start with um, Santiago played by Oscar Isaac, because I think his character really is summed up by the fact that he does change when he's with, within these situations, not so much the greed side of things. Um, uh, he was less swayed by that, but he certainly really lost his head a little bit when, when shit hit the fan. And he was kind of in this, um, yes, he was almost in charge initially, but then you obviously get, red fly to come in to be in charge and there's sort of this power not struggle because there's enough respect for each other but Santiago sort of struggles when things get tough and he kind of has to take the lead and he's making decisions emotionally instead of rationally which you know all we learn about these guys is how <laughs> clinical and dedicated they are to the task so it, it is nice to see that change in him and, and what uh, this circumstance has done to him yeah, I, I think that this 
this character in particular, like they try to show him as the, no, no, his, his positive motives are that he's been working in South America because he's been trying to, they make mention about him trying to empower the people down there or, or, or sort out or sort out these drug cartels by working with the government in South America. And I think that the, the thing for me that defines him is that he is happy to lie to a bunch of his mates and these people that he, he's, he's supposed to have so much respect for to get them on board with something that is almost his out. So even though the others mm. have already probably already got out of this, of the, the dangerous side of the business, he's the only one that, that is still really living that living that mm. life on the, on the edge by still being involved in, in, you know, using weapons and, and hunting people down in a, in a way that, um, you know, is, uh, I guess, physical compared to the others, even though some of them do, do do some physical things. I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think that it shows that the respect that the, the characters have, ha- have for this guy, but also a little bit, um, a little bit of a selfish sort of character in mm. the fact that he's happy to lie to get these people on board to do something that, maybe could be for him trying to settle down and and be with a love interest when you know he's putting so much more on the line than just that i don't think there's even really a maybe about it because he obviously got them in to do the job but deep down he knew that they were, he was always going to try and get them to do the job for himself he made it out like oh why don't we just do it ourselves and, and make yeah. all the money when deep down he knew that was the job anyway so yeah it's, it's a really good point you bring up yeah all right well i reckon we talk about um Ben Affleck's character, Red Fly. Yeah, and I, I think that... Um, oh, you go. You go first. Oh, no, like, to my point before about Santiago, Red Fly really changes his tune from the guy we meet at the start. I mean, the signs are there that this guy is fundamentally unhappy with his life, and it still does take some serious convincing to even get him on this expedition in the first place, and he almost just flicks a switch. Um and you can imagine that it's a, f- a switch that he's never flipped before because his reputation, similar to the rest of the team, is being cool and calculated on a mission. And that goes out the door when he's personally invested because obviously his past missions were a job that he wasn't personally invested in. But it's inevitably his really brutal downfall because once he spirals from uh, changing away from what he was like on other expeditions, things only get worse for him a- a- until he eventually dies. Um, because all the, all the mistakes that he makes from that point on are just an example of uh, things that he would just never have done before. And, and for him, it's, it's, it really is the greed side of things that just completely captures him, consumes him. Yeah. The, he, he's like this lost soul who, who can't find redemption. And like you mentioned, like the, maybe as a character, you know, he feels so rejected. And I think there's even this mention about, he feels like spat out by his career and, and all the good stuff that he, that he's done for his country. And then you've got these, these moments where the, the, the other characters constantly remind him that you're, you know, you're the one that follows the plan. You're the one that always leaves when it's time to leave. And, and you never miss the heart out. And, yeah. Never, yeah. Never miss the heart out. And um, you know, people do want to work for him, but because they know of his past experiences, but you can see that in there in a lot of the acting, a lot of the, the uh, the facial recognition that this is getting a bit out of control, like you mentioned, because whenever he made a made a choice that didn't necessarily um, go the right way, it just kept spiraling out of control. And um, yeah, I, I, I know it's Ben Affleck. So, like you mentioned yeah. at, the start, at the start of the show, like everyone's got a bit of a soft spot for Ben Affleck. And uh, even though you see him sort of turning into this this character, you, you still want to see him succeed. And I don't know if that's that's a part of the casting, possibly too. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. And and I think the one thing that we should mention is that he is the he's one of the guys who has gone back to try and fit himself into society, recognizing that he absolutely doesn't fit into society. And I think he makes mention of, you know, I, I came back as soon as he sort of put that gun in my hand and felt at home again. And yes, he's done it before, but he's never done it with the baggage of what life is like outside of it. And that's clearly just was just too much for him to handle. And uh, he needed to get everything he could to get out of the life that he had because you know he couldn't keep going back to it and he couldn't keep going back to working for the army and this was his out and he put everything into it for, for probably the wrong reasons. All right, who have you got next? I've got Charlie Hunnam's character, um, William Ironhead Miller. Didn't really hear him called Ironhead that much, but that's kind of cool. Feels like a um, feels like a transformer. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think for me, he was the most level-headed of the whole crew from start to finish. Um, and he, he rarely wavers to the temptation or the desperation. And for him, he's kind of always on the mission. And that clear line of thinking keeps him going. 
I felt personally that I connected with him more than any other character. And I connected him with him more and more as the film went on. And I find it interesting that he's the one who's technically still working or employed by the army or whoever it is working as a consultant or as a trainer or whatever. Um, and he, he's, he's had that regression that he talks about in the opening scene of the film where he's come back from, you know, when he obviously beat up that guy in the supermarket, he's had that regression and he understands that life could be worse. And he sort of pulled himself already back from that. And that's truly built his sense of character. Whereas Santiago and, and, and Red Flyer were potentially going through this regression on the mission, which is why I feel like Charlie Hunnam's character sort of stayed level-headed throughout the whole time because he knows what it's like to go to the deep end and these guys were sort of doing it for the first time. I found that kind of interesting because he was the one guy who was acting as if he was still in the army. Like even when they were burning the money, he was the one that's like, this is a bad idea. Even at the end when Santiago is kind of like, no, we're just going to gun through everyone and kill everyone. He was like, well, that's not really an option. So um, I found that an interesting part of his character that he'd been through it and the others hadn't. And and maybe that's saying something. Yeah. I think you've done that. I haven't got an awful lot extra ad because I think what you've touched on is exactly right. Like they make it very explicit at the start that this is a, a guy who, is known for completing missions is, is this sort of warrior character. And, and to further add to what you've said, I think that the the ability of him still doing these um, motivational type of speeches means that he's still seeing these types of soldiers that are still in their situation. So he's still very connected mm. to, to the actual action side of things. So when they are in those, those action situations, um, he's the most level-headed and he's the one that's able to, to, to reflect on this because he's like, can probably, you know, see in his mind all these people that he's talking to on a regular basis, them mm. in these situations and not wanting to see them downfall or, or, or be lost because he wants to keep that level head of what he's promoting to others as well. So I think, I think, yeah, I can't really add much more than what you've said. <laughs> no, that's good. All right. Who else? Uh, all right. We've got Francisco Catfish Morales played by <laughs> Pedro Pascal. Do they call him Frank? I, I, yeah, I'm reading these names. I don't really remember them, but the, um, yeah, they... <laughs> he he probably lacked a little bit of stability uh, and he got a little bit flustered, but in general, he probably played his role in the mission as he would have anticipated. He was clearly in this for more of a means to an end than the others were due to his criminal charge and the fact that he had a young family and he, he literally just needed this. And he was probably the most reluctant to actually come. Maybe he's the unwilling bandit or whatever that the Vietnamese title was, <laughs> was talking about. But I mean, he was, he was likable enough and I kind of always felt for him. He was just, yeah, he, he was him. I don't know. There's not much else to say. Yep. I, I agree. And that's the, probably the same with our Benny as well. Like uh, it was like that side character brother. So that there's some, uh, relate like there's a, a familiar sort of um, a, a family member on on board that you've got that extra sort of um, worry if another member dies or, or gets lost and I think yeah I think the last few characters are probably just more there as um, a part of the crew than massive focus on them. I think one in thing that was interesting with me about Benny is we didn't really get much of a backstory with him apart from the fact that he does you know fist fighting. Um, <laughs> so you kind of felt to me felt like he was either like a free hit or a safety net for the storytelling. So whenever things were like, oh, what can we do? I'll just use Ben for this part because we're kind of not worried about developing his story. And it's not necessarily a negative because I really like the guy, but it just made it easier for him to do all like little, little tasks. And you kind of like, well, if he dies, do we care as much? And if he doesn't die, then we don't need to worry about his journey to getting to a certain point. We just know that he's going to do it. Um, Cause yeah, I, I thought he was pretty <laughs> likable as charismatic, but it's probably the um, character that but, died in the original script. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He probably was. You, you're probably right. And, and I think it works better the other way. Mm, yeah. Um, I don't know. Anyone else you wanted to talk about? No, nah, not really. No. All right, good. Let's uh, all the director, JC Chandor, um, lots of producing, writing, directing credits. I guess the, the big ones were um, a most violent year, which also has Oscar Isaacs in it. Um, and the, I've seen the other one, all is lost with Robert Redford um, as well, that he's uh, directed and written too. Yeah. I've seen the most violent year and, it's definitely a more small, arty crime film than this one. This is obviously a bit more of a blockbuster, but obviously the Oscar Isaac link probably helped getting him on board here. Yes, definitely. All right. Um, talk about some scenes. Let's do it. All right. Give us some ones that you enjoyed in this one. 
I enjoyed um, the the pep talk scene at the start when you sort of find out that Oscar Isaac had brought them all there, um, basically to do the job for themselves as opposed to for the agency. And you know, I, I kind of like the when he went around and basically summed where everyone's life was at, and I, it kind of it made me more invested in the story, knowing that they're all doing it for themselves. So I, I think it kind of needed that at that point in time. Um, and then from that point, the, the heist scene, if you want to call it that, my heart was pumping that entire scene. And I wonder if a part of that was, I know there's an hour to go in the film when this was happening <laughs> and I'm like, well, something's going to go wrong. Like there's no, there's no way that they're going to successfully complete this heist that they'd just bugger off. And then we're going to have an hour of them going, Hey, how good was that? So th- that was an interesting, uh, like tactic or it's just, I guess, part of the story, but for, for like 15 minutes, my heart was pumping. Like something is going to happen. Something is around the corner. So I guess we're going to call that really good filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not necessarily a good scene, but I think it's a very memorable scene. And uh, the, the scene where the donkey falls down the um, falls down the cliff. And I, I, I found it very memorable because it's a big part of the film. But personally, it, I was literally at the site where they filmed that. And interestingly enough, it's basically the cliff edge that they were on was basically like a gutter. So it was about 30 centimetres high and they filmed the whole thing on that thing. And I, when they were telling me about it uh, on the tour that I went on, obviously I had no context for what the scene actually was, but it was cool to see it in place. But that was also very sad when the donkey died. I don't like killing animals. Um, I've only got two more scenes and you, you've sort of spoken about the whole idea of killing off um, ben Affleck's character because in my head I knew one of them at least one of them had to die um, and I just I wasn't expecting it to be Ben Affleck's character and I really liked it because I think it gave the story a kick at a time when it really needed a bit of a kick and and I, I love the idea of taking things out of what you're expecting because if I had it killed Benny or even um, even Catfish then I would have been a bit okay that's cool but they're they're semi-expendable so it was, um, I think it was a brave move and I think it paid off. And then finally, I love that um, Charlie Hunnam's character wrote down the coordinates of where they dumped the money because that, that ending kind of worked for me because you're watching this film and as a general movie watcher, you kind of just want the, you just kind of want them to do well, even though if you think they're questionable guys or whatever. So, but as a, as, a, as a filmmaker, you need to understand that you're trying to, you're trying to send a message with what you're saying. So if you've got these guys who are fundamentally bad dudes doing the wrong thing and they get away with it, it's like, what are you trying to say? So this film was kind of in between. If they get away with it, it's like, well, these guys have been a little bit shit. They're just sort of killing people for fun by the end of it. Um, and, but I also was like, but they're kind of not bad dudes. So how are we going to end this? How are we going to do this? And the idea of him leaving the coordinates of where the money is was like, okay, they didn't really get away with it. One of them died. It's been a pretty brutal journey, um, so let's just move on. But you know what? You know what? If you really want to, you might be able to go back and get that money. And I, 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 it just really sat well with me. It was just enough there for the ending to really work out. So that's that, that's kind of how I, I felt at the end of the film. So there's just enough there too for a sequel, like just in case that oh, it true. did well. Like I think I read something somewhere about that too. I think that that was a very late addition. I don't think that was in the original script with the coordinates. So I think that was something that was added in very very late. Um, but yeah, I, that was a good move. Sequel time. <laughs> quadruple frontier good is that you done for your scenes <laughs> that's that's me done for my oh, scenes um yeah I, th- I i enjoyed the opening scene of pope and the crew um catching that cartel i thought that was pretty cool um work the and I, I guess I, I think i might mention this later anyway on this the soundtrack throughout this film was was quite good um and a lot of the music that was used throughout there a lot of really good camera work throughout small little tight little streets you can just imagine how um hard that would have been to to film and shoot so i i, I appreciated that quite well um <laughs> just one little tiny bit where we, i mentioned before this this whole idea of pope um you know his connection or his informant is this good-looking girl, and I just liked the banter between him and Red Fly, where you know he makes a joke early on about him doing it for a girl, and then when they actually realise it's a girl, and it's just this really good one line of him saying like, you know, I I bloody knew it, like it was. Um, I thought that was an excellent, <laughs> good, good little timing, uh, and and the same um, you had this as well. The the actual heist that you mentioned of, of them going in the house, I 
like this, I have seen this film before. Um, and I could, I pretty much remembered everything scene for scene. And I just remember this scene and it still did the same thing for me. You're on the edge of your seat that whole time about what's going to happen. Just really well made. Um, and cool. I guess that that was done mm. like, you know, out in the middle of uh, the jungle in Hawaii <laughs> rather than uh, yeah, somewhere in South true. America. So, so that's cool. All right. Well, is there anything that you, you didn't like in this one? Only a couple of things. Um, that heist, the heist scene, the drug cartel um, siege scene that you spoke about, it just bothered me a little bit how easily um, Pope's informant escaped at the start, like from the handcuffs. Because the assumption, obviously he didn't handcuff her. She was taken out by someone else and she just had this move where she just went bang. I get the fact that she ran away from Pope because that was all set up. But um, yeah, it's a little bit too easy for me. I think would have liked yes, to see yeah. something a little bit better. Because when I'm trying to get into a film, I'm like, oh, I don't want to be questioning things this early on. Um, and the other thing was it just got a bit tiresome for me watching them just lugging and hurling bags of money around the mountain. Uh, I, I, there's a point where I couldn't really see the end game for them when they've got like a hundred bags of cash and they've just got to keep moving. Like, how's this going to end? You guys aren't going to be able to do this. And did you notice the boat that they had at the end? There's no way that boat was going to carry any anywhere near the <laughs> amount of money they had. So it was flawed for the start. Um, but yeah, that's why when they killed off Ben Affleck, I was like, I oh, finally, something's, something's happening. That's not them lugging money around. Yeah. They're uh, on the, cause like I mean, I've seen this before they the second watch, it was very obvious when they kept referring to, let's not have a fire. Let's not have a fire. Let's not have a fire. The first time I watched it, I didn't even pick up on it, but this time I'm like, okay, I know where this is going with the fire. So, so um, <laughs> that, that little frustrating. Like, but the the one thing that I, and you mentioned this before and things that you didn't mind, that little pep talk from Pope where he goes through the mm. reasons for each of them um, needing the money. Uh, I, I felt like they did a good enough job of letting us know as an audience in the setup of them, like what they needed to do rather than specifically, you know, or explicitly saying in your face that, you know, red flies, a hero who can't send his kids to college, you know, fish is a talented pilot with a Coke wrap. Benny just keeps fighting in cages, you know, and William's doing pep talks. Like I just felt like we'd already seen all that on the screen. I didn't know if I needed another reminder of that um, to, to get me on board. Cause I, I knew already why they're on board. Um, That's fair. But you know me, I love, I love some nice dialogue. I love a little bit of dialogue to get me, get me salivating a bit. And you, you get out, Oscar Isaac doing it right. <laughs> then you're going to get a tick. <laughs> yeah, that's completely fair. All right. Well, let's talk about some themes or some ideas. What, what was this one trying to say? I think we've touched on quite a few of these already. Yeah, we probably have. I think like the main one for me that stuck out was the idea of greed and, and how much it can control you and how much it can spiral out of control which is almost a theme in itself the idea of spiraling spiraling out of control and i, and I also think there's a big um exploration in in worth and, and self-worth and what defines you and how do you judge your own success and and you know the reason that they were doing this was because they kind of felt like they were cheated by the amount of work that they'd done and they weren't getting the result for that so well they're like well let's roll back into something that we know and something that we're good at and actually do something for ourselves and um yeah that, there's probably they probably all kind of tie into one don't they but they all tell the story together yep that you, what you mentioned that whole idea of you know these guys all feel let down somehow by the military or, or by their previous um you know jobs and and that leads into that greed and i guess it can be greedy but what's that difference between right and wrong too, I guess, like what's the justification for their actions? Are they doing this for the right thing just because they've felt let down or are they doing it because they actually deserve this? And I guess the second half of the film too, sort of turns into a survival film almost where oh, yeah. it, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a mental and physical battle to, to survive and make those right choices. And I think that the scene where the helicopter crashes in that sort of field with mm. you know the, the cocaine growing sort of people that, that sort of sets it off straight away as to we've got to make choices fast, quickly. We're under attack. We're under, we've got a lot of pressure. What are, what are those right choices that you can make when you, you do face these kinds of pressures? And they're all in a completely different page mm, as to what definitely. that choice is. Um, even yeah. at the end when Pedro Pascal's character is like, just shoot him, just shoot him. And Santiago's not shooting anybody. He's shooting mm. tires. He's shooting cars. Like um, it's, and that's, that's, that's why I think I like the concept of the story that, You've got these guys who are really well equipped to be doing these kinds of jobs. In fact, they probably did this job, you know, tons of times when they're actually on the job, not getting paid for it. The idea of them being like, why don't we just do it for ourselves, get all the benefits, as if that wouldn't 
you know, come into your head whilst you're actually working and whilst you're on the job when the benefits are enormous. But then when you get tasked with it, you know, you miss your heart out, you're taking more money than you actually needed. Like that was what was driving me crazy. They're going back for more and more money. It's like, you're not even going to be able to use this money in a lifetime. Why are you even doing it? Get out of there right now. We don't have a movie, obviously, if we do that. Mm-hmm. But um, that, that's, and that's why it, it all kind of worked for me. And then it, it allows you to tie into those themes that we just spoke about. Exactly. All right. Well, what did you take out of this film? I think this definitely would have been, been worthy of a big screen experience, which let's be honest, is happening less and less in our lives. <laughs> um, so if not, it, it's, it's a great Saturday night movie, you know, at home with the lights off, maybe give yourself a bag of popcorn, just strap yourself in and enjoy it. Um, but the other thing I did take away, I don't know if you noticed this, but Charlie Hunnam, got more and more British as the movie went on. There were some scenes where I'm like, hang on, has he been British this whole film? Obviously, we, we, he's, he's a Brit, but um, every now and then, he just like started speaking with a really, what, what felt like a really heavy British accent. And I was questioning myself, I'm like, maybe he's been British the whole, and then the next scene, he's American. I'm like, oh, no, maybe he just, he just got his pronunciation wrong in that scene. <laughs> no, I didn't pick up on that. So that's, yeah, okay. that can be frustrating at times though when you, you know, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, I mentioned that I think the soundtrack was really good throughout for this one, and I don't know, just watching this one, and when we're talking about the coordinates at the end too, like that set up for a sequel. I I think for me, I was like, and I was watching this, I was like, the big thing for me was I want like an almost like Irishman style prequel with like some de aging technology to actually show us how these guys met or their previous work together or like something about you know, cause it's a good setup that they all know each other. Like I'd like to see how they knew each other or what were some of their previous missions or things like that. I reckon that'd be a cool. Preview. Interesting. Very mm. interesting. Yeah. You but gotta yeah, hope yeah. that there's a story in it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Did you jump on IMDB to check anyone out? I actually didn't actually. Can I also say your point on the music at the early on when that sleep, sleep Mac basically went into Creedence Clearwater it was brilliant. And I thought this is going to be a banging soundtrack to the whole movie. And it kind of, didn't lift up, live up to those heights, but you're right. The, the music was yeah. pretty bloody good. Yeah, I agree. But I, I didn't I jump didn't on jump. IMDb, did you? Nah, nah yeah. me either. So that leads into questions. Do you have any questions that you wanted to ask? We've sort of been dancing around this question a little bit. And I've, I was going to ask, I was thinking about this question with a few minutes to go prior to the coordinates being, being delivered. I was going to say like, would you try and, you know, find that money? But now I'm saying if you're these guys and you've got the skills and they have resources as well, how long until you are going back for those bags? Ooh, I, f- I feel like it would be a pretty tricky situation because the as they're escaping, there's so many people still hunting them and they would have seen how little they walked away with. So you'd think they'd probably try and track out where they'd, where they'd gone. So I don't know. I'd probably I'd be pretty concerned going back. Interesting. I, um, but it felt like such a safe place to dump them, but you're right. Maybe, maybe I'd wait a little bit until the, <laughs> until all the hot airs, you know, no longer, no longer there. And everyone's not trying to kill you anymore, but man, I'm going back in a heartbeat. You've got a guy who can fly a helicopter. You just got to land. It's pretty isolated where they were. You just got to land that. You, you, there's a bit of logistics to sorting it out, but now nah, you can get it done and yeah, and you'd want all to do of a sudden it's everything not, becomes not worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, you want to do it yeah, in the summer and everything so it hasn't frozen over too a lot of money there jesse a lot of money there's a lot of money there any other questions no that was all i had i've i just want to say would you classify this as a heist movie and would Heath like it <laughs> well I, it has to be a heist movie right <laughs> like then he's got me all paranoid about what I define as a heist anymore. That's why I said, "Were we calling it a heist?" Of course, it's a bloody heist. Like <laughs> yes. taking all the money. Um, would Heath like it? Heath would absolutely like it. He he'd be all over this sort of movie. Would he? Would he define it as a heist movie? I'm not 100 percent sure he would. Yeah, me either. That's uh, the same thoughts. I don't know if he would. The, not enough. The plot. He didn't revolves think, around. He didn't heist. think Coin Heist was a heist movie, even though <laughs> that was the, in the title. movie was about a heist. But anyway. <laughs> I've got one other one. Um, it's all, it's almost like a Han Solo question. Who shot first at the village? Because they try to they try to discuss this um, together. Who who shot at the, that village first? I thought I thought Ben Affleck shot first, and yeah, me Pedro too. Pascal reacted. Yeah, I think so too. Good, that's an um, easy one. Yeah, and Ben Affleck, you know, got his comeuppance for it. All right, well, time to wrap this one up where we give the film a rating out of five and come up with an average, hopefully. So what are your final thoughts, MJ? <laughs> hopefully. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, look, as I said, it's slightly out of my wheelhouse, um, but a lot of it really did work for me. So putting these guys in messed up situations and seeing how they react, how they fold, how they persevere was probably the highlight of it. Um, but also just good actors in good enough roles, a couple of scenes that got the blood pumping. They're all signs of the success and an enjoyable watch for me. So I'm, I'm giving it three and a half stars. So the only reason I said uh, hopefully was because I didn't trust my maths in case you gave me something that I had to work out too hard. Um, There's so, only two of us. <laughs> yeah, I know. Still, I struggle. Um, but yeah, like like I mentioned before, this is like a, it's a good old fashioned action film um, and it works so well because of the cast and the way it looks as well. And I, I've, I've touched on this. I think I would probably be more interested in the prequel rather than a sequel, but um, I guess that's a question of whether they can get this cast back together again. And if they can get everyone back on board, um, I'd be on board too. So I'm also giving it a three and a half, which is oh, it's just an easy oh, one. I don't have to do any math. Don't have to do any math. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so three and a half. <laughs> we are on social media. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have Instagram. Please give us a like or a follow or subscribe to us on your favorite podcast subscription services. Question that I wanted to pop up this week, which MJ's already asked me, but does Pope go back to get the coordinates? I'll uh, go back to get the cash with those coordinates. So <laughs> we've already answered this, but I want to know Surely. what you guys think too. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm sorry. I, I'm not saying he is, but I, if I'm him, I am. I had not even, not even a question about it. That's it's happening. Maybe it's, maybe it's a year's time. Time. maybe it's really trying to make sure everything's okay again people have forgotten about it but go there if the money's not there go back you got a guy who can fly a helicopter do it get it done good <laughs> all right well we, we are back again next week for another film uh we have a another 2019 film it's the biographical comedy drama the dirt which is based on motley crew story i'm 99 oh, sure right. it's directed by jeff tremaine it stars douglas booth Colson Baker, Daniel Weber, Iwan Rion, and Pete Davidson. So that's what we've got coming up on our next episode. If you wanted to play along at home, play along. Yeah, can awesome. We, can we, we? We might even get you back. Maybe I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? I, I will endeavor. I will endeavor to be back. That's my plan for now. Is to be back. It's been a interesting couple of months. Uh, not doing it. Got got very busy with certain things. Um, and now I feel like I'm potentially seeing a little bit of a light. So we'll, we'll see how we go, but I would like to. Good. I'm taking that as a lock-in. So I'm writing it down now. Lock-in. <laughs> lock-in. We're in lockdown at the moment. So why not? Yeah. Why not? Well, thank you for coming along. It's been good to have some company. And I, I think we've had a good chat about this one. You are welcome. It's always excellent to talk about these sorts of films. Good. And um, I will see you next week. <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> Let's do it.